WDC 2012. Um, um, Telling all of us how big and explaining the briefings. If you're one band on one minute, the incorrect time is over, please information can and should be offered. If you're a second band on six minutes, please know more points of information. Seven, if you're a double band, which means basically interrupt your speech. Um, if you're a triple band at 715, which means that we are no longer taking down um, taking down anything that you are saying. Um, and so you know, probably a good time to stop. Um, so without any further delay, I would like to call upon the leader of the government to open the case of seven minutes. In the 1960s, when the tiny island state of Singapore, at that time a third world nation, decided to create a public housing program, it was a subject of much ridicule, primarily from the so-called first world, primarily from Western Europe. That country has ever since built one of the most secure systems of public housing and moved an immense fraction of its population from poverty to the corner of economic success. That is exactly what you desire hope to recreate in cities and municipalities across the world. We think that this is most urgently concerned and most plausibly a political plan in places like Western Europe, in cities like New York City, in cities like Boston, places where the state actually has the capacity and financial resources to conduct these sort of plans, but we also think this is a good idea, and if the state can and does marshal the resources to do so, it also should pursue it in many parts of the developing world that face similar concerns, places like Mumbai, places like Lagos, we think that all of those countries should attempt to recreate Singapore's model of indeed creating public housing for the poor all throughout the country and not only in destitute projects on the corner of town depriving individuals of the dignity they need the socio-economic mobility. First government is going to bring you primarily two axes. The first of which is that what individuals need to succeed in the long term. Narratives that are told to you mostly by so-called Western liberal democracies. Narratives such as the American dream or the so-called race to life are narratives that are only possible when individuals have access to fundamental opportunities. Opportunities that include things like access to a school that is not immensely segregated. It's opportunities such as an access to a school in which all subjects, subjects that allow you to then pursue an engineering degree in college are even possible. That is something that does not exist when individuals are locked off in parts of town. We're going to tell you why that's going to be. The second axiom first government is going to bring to you, and this is what primarily Julius is going to talk to you about, is why even if we don't provide these long-term opportunities for social economic mobility, even if the Singaporean dream is not replicable in other parts of the world, we say at the very least, the political provision of welfare services that individuals need for short-term survivability for the ability to reclaim things beyond very basic food stamps is something that is better provided when individuals who are poor and individuals who are rich are part of the same instead of parts of different and therefore differently powerful political constituencies. Three things in the rest of this Prime Minister's speech. First, why living in a wealthy area? Why when we should these poor people into relatively richer parts of the same cities and municipalities doesn't mean living a much more expensive Second of all, why where you live determines a huge part of how you live, and specifically how you will live in the future. And finally, why politics in turn determines a huge set of these opportunities you have access to in your life, and why the calculus of politics will change for these long-term social economic A little bit of model before I go on to this. Now, Judith and I are not going to be incredibly specific and be like 20% here, 20% there, we're going to say hey, this is exactly what wealthy and poor means. Obviously, this is going to vary from city to city, from municipality to municipality, developing more than the But very broadly, when we envision the wealthy, we're thinking broadly, for instance, to take American statistics of the top quarter of the economic, of, of the economic spectrum and of the poor, we're broadly thinking of the bottom quarter. We recognize much variation even within the strategy, which is why we say to the very poorest, we uh, let know, thank you, provide public housing just through a system such as explicit grants. This is exactly what Singapore does. 
to the people who might have the capacity to pay or who might someday have the capacity to pay, we're going to provide no interest or interest free loans. This is what's important to people, up to people who have incomes up to 8,000 US dollars per month. We think that that is a perfectly reasonable system. We're not even going up to that 8,000 dollar mark. We're going to say the bottom quarter is a rough estimate of what might work in many cities that we're talking about. So, on to the facts. First, why living in a wealthy area doesn't mean living in a immensely wealthy lifestyle. We recognize the opposition might try to tell you in this debate that you're casting poor people, no thank you, who are otherwise helpless into situations that they might struggle even harder to keep afloat in. We don't think this is true. We recognize that in the majority of urban environments, the largest fraction, no thank you sir, the largest fraction of what individuals spend as part of their disposable income is on housing itself. If it's true that as per our model, government defers this spending either through low interest loans, either through no interest loans, or better still for people at the very poorest ends of the spectrum, for instance in the United States, plot of the bottom, the bottom 10% of the income of water, we think that all of these would make that huge fraction of your income that you spend on housing no longer a valid consideration of the thank you where you live. We think that the remaining ways in which you spend your income, things like, for instance, on education, things like on direct food, for instance, things like transportation, all of these things will go down immensely. And in fact, we're going to give you good reasons for why we think that individuals in the society are going to access opportunities that better allow them to access, for instance, higher paid jobs, higher paid schools. Which brings me directly on to my, to my second point. Why where we live determines a large part of how we live. The problem is most evident in places of taking a second sir. Actually, I'll take it right back. So, like, you're yeah. okay to create a public housing for the poor. So, why is it necessary? You need in the context of the wealthy area. For a very clear reason that the kind of education, the kind of jobs, even hourly wage jobs, Mr. Speaker, that you get in wealthy areas in cities like Amsterdam or New York City or Los Angeles are immensely different in the quality of education and the quality of jobs from the kind of jobs that you get in the corners of the very same localities such that these people don't even recognize that they're living in the same cities. What Julius and I say is the, that what provides most prominently and most easily for your associated not mobility is to place kids from poorer socioeconomic strata within the same educational districts, within the same areas where you can access hourly jobs that pay, for instance, $15 an hour in New York City, whereas other hourly jobs with exact same skill levels on the outskirts of, 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 of town pay $7.50. Around. We think that those differentials are significant. Those differentials can make the difference between socioeconomic mobility, make the difference between having the skills and having the upward mobility opportunities that you might not have in other parts of town. We think, therefore, at the end of the speech, what I've shown you is first of all that we don't immensely increase the amount of money that individuals have to spend in, in living their lifestyles in wealthy parts of town as long as you subsidize an appropriate part of town. The second is that we give you opportunities to better jobs and better education that you do not get on the outskirts of town because we are happy to be shut. We're happy to be closed. Yeah, thanks for your speech. I'm not only in the opposition to open there. Yes.
example I give to you. Why are we paying taxes to the local government? And we need to use the local government. And second example I give you, how are we taking a postal? The actually the participation of the citizens for the local government, the quality will actually decrease and how it is going to be more for, for the rich people and the poor people. But before the Mrs. Speaker, let me be brought to the opening government. So Mrs. Speaker, basically what they have told is this. The rich and the poor people, they're in the poverty, they're short of the food, they, 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 they cannot earn much, much money. So however, after the proposal, because they can live in the most rich area, they can get a better education, they can, they can get a better, like, better like, salary. However, Mrs. Speaker, all of these problems can be solved by distributing more food stamps or raise the minimum wage in the local area or actually like raise the whole quality of the education. So they never ever explain the deepness of why they can ascribe the government to take care of poor people solely on the shoulder of the big people, of big people. We say it is totally unjust. And moreover, Mrs. Speaker, taking the most these proposals wouldn't actually lead to the increase of the, let's say, education level of poor people. Because it's such a gated community, like actually all, almost all the schools they have are private schools. So actually the quality of the public school is not necessarily high can just take a proposal for the actually and has the right of the poor people. So Mrs. Speaker, let me move on to my substance. First I would like to tell you why we are carrying taxes here at So Mrs. Speaker, to take the reason why we pay taxes, we say zero generate two things. Firstly, because it's duty. Two, which is on the shoulder of all the citizens. We pay the taxes in order pay taxes in order to pay the, the poor people, which the everyone has to pay, pay no matter you live in the rich community or you live in the middle community. In this way, in by paying so we, we actually make up our pension system and country, or we, we make sure for social welfare. The like we of which the all the citizens living in the country are same sharing the same burden and sharing the same duty. And we say in today's context, which people have fully accomplished this duty. Second reason why we are paying taxes. It is for our social benefit, our social service. So actually because those citizens are living in that local government, they have the right to determine how the tax they pay is going to be used. So actually that is the reason why for the local community public service has a spectrum to the certain extent. So because the citizens who pay the tax have a determination power to A, how much they demand for the public service, and B, how much money, how the money is going to be distributed. So first thing, Mr. Speaker, is that actually people say they do not want much public services. But all the what the local government must do is to fulfill the minimum requirement of that area and actually do not spend much on that. Or if there's so much demand on let's say education or public transportation for the citizens living in that local area, the government, local government has an incentive to use that money to that area. In this way, by paying the taxes, they can determine how that money is going to be used. And because it is about the equal balance of the, the right to pay the taxes and the right to participate in the local government, it is not, it is you, you can either cannot be missing in order to fulfill this law. So actually, that is the reason why, even though like, that's the reason why, so in some area, they tend to prioritize that they go to education, more than public transportation. So they tend to like, uh, they tend to respect the individual right and do not decide not to spend much on these people. And Mr. Speaker, in today's context, when the rich people are paying the taxes, they have a determination problem. They would like to use, they would like to have the tax used for, the, for their benefit. They would like to put, they would like to increase the quality of their public transportation, their public service. However, by taking the proposal, the actually the poor people are going to be the free riders for those taxes. taxes. So we say it is totally unjust but before the guests. It might be true that rich people might not get everything they like in systems of social security. Mm -hmm. But is it true, perhaps, that poor people might be doing a little more than free riding to at least claim access to the kind of opportunities that are denied to them unless far as the governments can place them on the outskirts? But that kind of claim is still not the reason to ascribe the burden to take care of the poor people solely on the shoulder of the rich people. If they would like to increase the poor people's quality of life, we are happy to do that. However, that burden must be shared by all the citizens living in the, our country. And they have all the justification to take over. So, Mr. Speaker, sit down. Let me tell you what is going to happen after the impulse. 
which people who have no hope of a better future are capable of gaining access to opportunities. If the answer is clearly that the fundamental rights that afford those opportunities have to outweigh the tax money that the rich are going to have to spend now so that they'll actually end up spending less in the future. Now, Mr. Speaker, how does this trade in more just society where fundamental rights are respected for all individuals? Mr. Speaker, under the status quo, we have a division into two Americas, two Britons, two Australians, where we have a situation where many of rich people live in gated communities while the poor live in the slums below, Mr. Speaker. What that has caused, Mr. Speaker, is the lack of upward mobility that my partner has talked about, and we've been particularly well. My new point, Mr. Speaker, is to talk about how this has become a political problem. What happened, Mr. What has happened, Mr. Speaker, is that the poor have been placed in districts away from the major neighborhoods where their problems consistently move, where the politicians are easily outvoted in legislation, Mr. Speaker, in municipalities, and therefore those communities simply don't get the same sort of social services that the rest of us get, Mr. Speaker. But this has led to the political problems that we've seen recently in countries like Greece and Britain, where austerity or cuts in social services has been on the backs of the poor. When countries like Britain, the Tory government is now looking to cap welfare benefits as a means of saving money, partly because those districts that are in the poor neighborhoods can simply be ignored for the sake of the larger population, whose social services will be more important to those populations. Under our model, Mr. Speaker, the poor and the rich, I'll take you one moment, live together. Both have an interest in benefiting that particular community. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, if a park is funded, it can't simply be a park that goes either for the rich or for the poor, but rather it can be a park that can benefit everyone. We think political ideas, this kind of notion is totally irrelevant because even after taking the proposal, the poor are still a minority and the city and the areas are still dominated by. But here's the thing let's say the rich want to construct a park. Under the status quo, that park is only for the use of themselves simply because the poor are in need of that park to access it. But now, when those social services are constructed in those very same neighborhoods, there will be poor individuals who are in the position to access it. And that, that's the big difference under our model. And that again, Mr. Speaker, when you have those political avenues helping both rich and poor, it helps lead to sort of upper mobility my partner talked about. Because the parks and the safe streets and the schools will be for everybody because everybody lives in that very same neighborhood. And you can't have a situation where money is disproportionately given to neighborhoods which are rich while the neighborhoods which are poor are in. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, leave this house deal with the assumption that very rich people have under the status quo. As a matter of fact, there's two different possibilities that the rich, uh, two different mindsets that rich people have under the status quo. The first thing is that I don't care about the poor. They live in the slums below. I don't really have to be concerned about, be concerned about them. They're not really my problem. The other possibility, Mr. Speaker, is that they think that the poor are actually living in decent conditions, that the squalor that happens and that is occurring right now in slums all across this world isn't actually happening. We think, Mr. Speaker, we deal with both those assumptions. For the callous rich individual, Mr. Speaker, we said that now that person will have to be living among you. Now you will actually have to, de have to have social services that actually help them rather than just help yourself. And now you will actually have to live, have to actually see what is going on. And for the person, Mr. Speaker, who is simply ignorant, we said, now the problems of poverty will be brought to your doorstep. You will no longer be able to ignore the problems that our social structure have created. You'll actually have to see that these individuals need other things besides housing. Need things like welfare, Mr. Speaker. Need to have the basic day-to-day -day necessities that many of us all take for granted. When you have that, Mr. Speaker, you have less severe austerity cuts in programs for the poor. Because these individuals who are the mainstream voters will no longer think that those programs are necessary for them, will no longer think, as the opposite seems to think, that this is merely free riding that these individuals could easily get off welfare, they chose to do so, or will actually understand that it's a problem with fundamental human rights and our society's necessity of caring for individuals who simply cannot care for themselves, especially in situations where the housing policies of the government have created or have certainly helped make worse those very problems. So what have I brought to you today? What's that part of that brought to you today, Mr. Speaker? We spoke to you first about how this opens up the avenues of social mobility for the poor, and it's like actually reducing the amount of welfare burden on the tax system as a whole. And second, we've talked to you about how this creates political incentives, Mr. Speaker. How um, now things like parks and schools cannot simply be for the rich or for the poor, but will be geographically speaking accessible to all individuals. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 for a speech, I call upon Takanori. Takanori? I call upon Takanori to.
Ladies and gentlemen, we still don't have any sort of engagement to my partner's arguments, because my partner really told you the moral justification why it is unjust to ascribe the burden and shift the burden to say the poor just on the, on the shoulder of the rich. They never engage because they just said the problem is about social mobility. But the social mobility is that first of all, that we need that the rich people have already fulfilled their responsibility to the society. Secondly, the even problems happen, but it is not a thing that owned by or only by the rich people. We should all this close mobility issue as a society. Therefore, we are very proud to vote. So uh, as I do some answers, I'd like to talk about two things. Why? Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about why after giving this proposal this would be disincentivized the rich people to still remain in this area and these people are likely to get out of the area is going to be huge harm for the poor people. About me, I'd like to talk about why I'm taking this proposal. It's going to be a huge, uh, huge obstacle for the political progress that try to allocate the more resource to the poor. No, thank you. But before that, I'd like to talk about the summary button. So, the key prime minister came up and said, first of all, so we see social mobility issues, like, for example, in Singapore. So this is disproportionate attention and risk. I have the wealth of the shoulder of the rich people. Yes, we acknowledge that. But two responses we have. First the first we have is, as I told you, Mr. Speaker, that in the in the vast majority of country, in the liberal democracy of the country, we say that we say these rich people have already fulfilled their own duties, Speaker. For example, that we have the higher progressive tax on the shoulder of the rich people. Actually, in the United States, the rich people are actually um, actually paying a billion a billion of a billion of dollar actually, Mr. Speaker, compared to uh, which is very large compared to the amount that the middle class the middle class people and poor class people are actually paying. No, and moreover, these people actually have a huge inheritance tax. Like, for example, the, uh, <coughs> these people the can't, have, can't get the asset given by their parents without paying a huge amount of tax. For the society, Mr. Speaker, we say their, their duty is have, have already accomplished. Second of all, Mr. Speaker, even though this kind of situation has happened, but we say it is unjust to just because I think just because there is a rich area, just, just let it rich people, Mr. Speaker. Because, no. Because what they're saying is that there are no justification. They say just because this, this provides high quality for the poor people, we should do that. But just because we can provide high quality, we doesn't make the, uh, that doesn't make the poor kids into the, into the rich private school and making the rich parents to pay the tuition fee of those, those poor children, Mr. Speaker. But we say this issue of social mobility should be balanced by regarding the certain minimum standard of duty fulfillment and moreover the rich people's the freedom to associate with anything that they want that they think that this will improve the quality of life. No, thank you. So, moving on to the second of all. So, they talk about the people are living in the slum, in the status quo. The lack of availability is a huge problem, right? But, two responses now. First response we have is that if this is lack of availability is a problem, so why don't we make this house built in the middle class or built in the, the area that is not necessarily in the wealthy area? We see no any uniqueness to take this proposal explicitly. Second of all, speaker, that if we make this kind of build this house on the uh, <coughs> on the rich area of the speaker, but we, when it comes to rich area, we have to get it from the speaker. We see the less business on the speaker because the rich people are actually the stockholder, actually the manager, the actual having the workplace which is far from this community. They're using the community to educate their kids, to have them to serve a certain quality of life by just having the food, having just the welfare system or the house or whatever. So when it comes to the middle class area, it provides more economic prosperity and more economic uh, viability, having more the more business, which is actually much better for the rich people. So just because we build this kind of wealthy uh, Public housing in the wealthy area, it doesn't automatically benefit and empower those poor people in the first place. And lastly, they just asserted that after taking this 
for modal we can instead solve the issue, for example, this, whole, this proportionate power that's given by given to the poor. But as I told you in my POI, even after taking this proposal, these poor people are still remain in the uh, in the flavor of poverty. But there's a still huge power disparity between the rich and poor regarding the number and moreover regarding the financial power that they can provide the lobby activity force the political area that disproportionately benefit the rich people in the first place. We see no solution coming from their side of the house. So I have rebutted moving on to my technology of the In principle, do the opening opportunities support any public housing for by the government in using the public resources which the rich people is also contributing to? Yes, but what we are saying is that this kind of burden should not be solely owned by the rich people. This is a burden that something carried out at a society, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> so, let me go on to my substantive. No, thank you. So, my first substantive is why actually we going to create a huge harm for the poor. So, after taking the proposal, what we're going to see is that first of all, tangible harm. For example, the increase in crime rate, because the poor people actually see the target of the crime. If people are likely to commit a crime, stealing or whatever, and moreover, the intangible harm will be created. For example, stigma, as the part that they told you. That these people have the less connection with the, uh, with the poor people. These people have like, more likely to have a certain stigma that poor people are dangerous by just seeing that some cases, which is exaggerated by the media, that poor people is likely to commit the crime or whatever was speak up. We say this kind of situation pre provide an app, provide an app to provide anxiety for the rich people to still remain in this area. And these people are highly, highly discouraged to still remain. So after they can support all the rich area, the rich people are more likely to get out from this area and break this up. We see the huge break and explosion of gay community in the past place. What will happen as a consequence? We see the sheer decrease amount of tax given by the rich people speak up, which, which, which can be triggered down to the poor people. So we say this amount, amount of wealth, uh, amount of wealth that is given by uh, given to the poor people will be significantly decreased. Let's create a situation again in the, like in the status quo speaker. We see this huge uh, very huge huge harm uh, under the current situation. Lastly, my part uh, lastly about the political division speaker. Because uh, after the proposal, the rich people feel that these people have already given so much like uh, concede, so much benefit of political uh, asset allocation for the rich people. It's gonna be a huge obstacle for the poor, poor people to persuade the rich people to allocate the more resources to the poor people, Mr. Speaker. We say this is this going to create uh, uh, the stop of the progress to support the poor in the first place, Mr. Speaker. So what we have told you, the first of all, the just because it provides a higher quality, it doesn't necessarily mean that we just sacrifice the rich people the first place. Freedom to associate uh, that something that they improve their life should be protected. Be a boss. I would like to thank the speaker for his speech and thank the entire staff. Thank you all. I'll call the next speaker for the proposition to continue that. Case. Gentlemen, in understanding today's debate, we need to understand what this policy is about. This policy is not about raising the tax on the rich and asking them to pay more burden on the social security provided to the poor. It's merely when, when making the decision about where we allocate the poor, where we create public housing areas which offers you the streets where we place them. Whether we place them in the outskirts of the city or whether we place them together with the rich so that we can bring together these two extremes of our society together to form a more just and equitable society. That's the consistent position for our youth part of government. So in closing government, what we bring to you today is first we analyze to you how does the rich people's dominance in today's world of this cause how they have this proportionate influence on the government's decision making and how this is badly influencing and accelerating the problem between the rich and the poor. So we will also tell you extending the code uh, work brings to you by the opening government how seeing is doing how this policy will actually substantially change the mindset of these rich people so that they can when they are making those decisions, when they are like influencing lobbying the government to take certain positions, they will be more embracing and comprehensive 
towards the poor, and why do we think this is better for our society? But before that, certain engagement of the opposition. Firstly, they have this mysterious belief that by doing this policy, we are adding extra burden and unfair and unjust burden on the rich people. Not only that, but what we do recognize that the rich people are already fulfilling the duty in paying higher taxes and more taxes and contributing more to the society. We do think that we as a society, the government as a source, we do have to take care of every citizen. This duty is uh, owed equally to every citizen. So far, I would say the poor that are in such uh, dynamics, we think we think that the uh, not quite a sponsor. We think that the, the necessity to provide public housing so that they can have a meaningful and dignified life is just about which opportunity has no question of that. But then they talk about how we are adding extra burden on the rich people because like we are sharing the same community uh, resources and by then we are taking away what rich people are already entitled to. Is that what we think on the government side is that by doing this policy, you are like forging the, the sense of community in which is unrealistic, under the status quo. By doing so, when you are making these two groups exposed to each other on a daily basis, you are forging a better future for society, which will be more in our, in our extension before that closing. How do you push poor people into the streets of the rich and magically see them prosper and integrate well into society? In that general, it's a, it's a matter of comparison. Nowadays, where the rich groups are located and where the poor are located, they're miles and miles away even in the same city. So we, 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 are, we, are, we are consistent with the whole thing government analysis, but we think that it's a dangerous situation where the rich can safely and confidently turn a blind eye to all those desperate social problems happening in our society. Because we think that that's a dangerous situation. More analysis in my second extension. One would we think that this daily exposure is a healthy side of the in our society. Secondly, we want to engage with some of the unique harms that were brought by the working opposition. Firstly, is the temple on but like the increased crime rate. Firstly, we think that it's kind of a discriminatory uh, uh, description on, and we think that it's unjust to place that burden like label on the poor people. But more important, we think it's merely a practicality problem, which if the government is doing so by creating this public housing area, which wherever they are placing it, they do have an imperative to control and manage a better security. So we, do, we don't think that's an actual problem which will be on the Secondly, it's about the intangible harm, where there will be stigmatization and where there will eventually be the rich people leaving our country and leaving us in more black poverty. Firstly, we think that, uh, in contrast, it's not really a stigmatization because we think that nowadays it's not rich stigmatizing the poor in some sense. It's more about the rich ignoring and turning a blind eye to the poor. And when they are helping the government, they, they want to preserve their self interest instead of creating a more just society. So we, we don't think that. We think that by doing so, it's removing systematization in an other direction. It's by making these, like, letting these poor people understand how these rich people actually live, and it, you're removing that kind of systematization between the tension between the poor and the, and the, and the rich. So, if you have to take a wouldn't like poor people try to end and stop and be rich people by directly seeing how they're prospering by having, let's say, private drivers? How the integration is specifically going to happen? Please explain. Ladies and gentlemen, what I understand, again, is a comparison. Nowadays, these poor people, they are only hearing all this news about how these rich people have been unjustly enriched by our current societal structure and how they are living all those outrageous life compared with their own bad situation. But once we adopt this policy, where we create a livable environment for these poor public housing areas, for these poor near the wealthy area, we think that firstly we satisfy that immediately need. Secondly, we also give them a better chance, better chance to actually understand how these rich people are just living and all the well, we do think that there are, the difference will still exist. We think that like, the more important contribution in this society is how this policy will change the mindset of the rich people and how this will actually bring a better society. Because we think that there will be more engagement from the rich side. We think the crux of this debate is on the rich people, how, how they will be affected by this policy. So, on to our extension. First thing we need to clarify to you how we think that uh, uh, sad situation in our in our society where the rich people get a disproportionate influence on the model of decision making. 
to say that the very fact that in mid properties like uh, maybe when he told the rich that 47 percent of our country were entitled like feel like victim which we can't help we can't change the mindset anyway we think that that's the very situation we want to deal with because among the rich there's this mindset about this poor people they feel like a victim they are burdened on society because they, essentially these rich people they don't really know what's happening these two people are analyzed by the opening government. But what we're saying is more than a communal level. The distinction is that while the government, opening government says that while well, the rich people may fight on the same front when fighting for like common uh, society, uh, common communal resources, we think that in a more broader sense, when making those national decisions, the rich people actually has more like they are more exposed to these poor people's situation. No longer will they like they no longer will the poor people only exist in like statistics or like newspaper reports or in the news of for these rich people. So we think that by uh, adopting this policy, we actually allow these rich people to have a real sense of what's going on for these poor people. So secondly, is quickly how will this change the mindset for these rich, rich people and for the better future for society? We think that by and by forcing them to that like engage in a daily and commercial basis. We think that it provides a better chance for the two extreme of our society to better understand each other. So we think that it creates a more just and equitable society. We are very proud of both. Thank you. I would like to thank the speaker for his speech and for our to continue on your stuff. No, 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 ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what is coming out of this side of the house. Um, I'm the government. You guys are rich. Right? I take your money, I put a building right here, and fill it to the brim with poor people, shit from this other part of town. I take your schools, I subsidize the cost because you're paying a lot, right? You're paying more than you're supposed to, I pay some uh, so that I put poor people into your school. And basically, I just try to subsidize education, healthcare, housing, everywhere in your poor, rich area from the money you're giving me, just so they can use to provide for this building I just set up in your beautiful area. They and gentlemen, we on this side of the house strongly oppose. Um, basically, what we've heard from this side of the government so far has been, um, firstly, the biggest point, the second, uh, the first speaker of the closing uh, comment came up and said, we are trying to change the mindset of the rich. Ladies and gentlemen, we keep this ambition just by putting up a video of rich people, poor people in area, your area, it's not going to change your mindset. If anything, it's not a hard resentment. What they believe is they will be great in interaction. They'll be exposed to each other. It'll be hard for love and affection suddenly because the poor people are going to keep your money. They can, we believe that is trash. That's just not going to happen. That's going to be no view. They come in and they hear also deny it. This first speaker came up and said, oh, um, we're going to live in, we're going to take money from the rich as taxes because they have a responsibility towards the less fortunate and the government has a role to play in the society. We live in this video in view. When the rich money is taken from the rich, um, it is supposed to be spent on the rich. However, if you're so bent and I, if you're so bent on taking their money to use on the poor, we'll propose a solution later with much better. They keep alluding to Singapore's public housing program that was started way back when, and Singapore's turned into this magical land of all buildings and rich people. They then and these seem to be functioning in the belief that that uh, public housing scheme operated in a bubble. Our argument that is not true. That public housing scheme came with a set of other reforms that helped the poor people. Uh, Enable themselves rather than being enabled. They help the poor people uh, create jobs in their own poor areas rather than just moving and migrating to the rich area and trying to squeeze into their schools. They have to, they have to uh, accept that this program is not denied. They have to accept that this program is not operating above them. They come and they said that suddenly because the poor people will be in the rich areas that have access to schools, there's less discrimination and wider range of subjects to study. They come and they forget that these schools are really expensive. Schooling in private areas is very expensive, and when you bring in poor people, they will not be able to afford it from the get go. You cannot uh, push poor people for free into rich schools. They can, there's a reason. Uh, education and healthcare is a luxury. If, if rich people uh, can afford it, it is their right to do so. It should, they should not be made to feel bad that, oh, you're going to a rich school, maybe these poor people, you should pay double, so they can also go. Then we believe that it is infringing on the rights of the rich. They came up and said that living in the wealthy areas will not be more expensive for the poor people because the largest chunk of the cost is the housing, um, whereas the food and other costs remain the same. But then they also came up and said that there will be better jobs and opportunities provided in the rich areas because people pay more for those services in the rich areas. Therefore, the poor people will be able to earn more because 
they will be able to provide those services to the rich. Suddenly, make more money. You're kind of discriminating when you say they won't be paying any more for any services. But then you're also saying that hey, services cost more, so they'll be able to make more in those areas. Um, then they came up and said that where you live determines how you live. Let them, we believe that that's an incomplete point because unless an entire circle is completed, just putting them into the rich people uh, area will not mean that they'll suddenly start owning cars and going to fancy car schools. We believe that even that there are more efforts needed. Um, from the government and just that. But since they're so bad at taking rich people's money and using it to help the poor, we believe they didn't mean that what they're proposing is basically a welfare state and we are going to talk about how it's not going to be good. So I will take you. Well, government is already allocating certain common resources to uh, help the people. Why can't we integrate the society better? This is just possible. We're going to address that PY in our last point. We're going to talk about how a welfare system is not the way to use that money, even if that money is going to have to the poor. Then we're going to talk about in our extension about how a welfare state that they're proposing is a try to fail concept. Uh, we're going to talk about how it's going to kill the free market that's available. We're going to talk about how it's actually decreasing the strength of the poor and decreasing their representation in the government. We're going to talk about how it's going to incentivize unemployment. And lastly, then we're going to say that it's going to actually promote more discrimination. Uh, so moving on, ladies and gentlemen, welfare state is not a routine matter. Um, it's not something you do by default. We believe that welfare state is an extreme uh, case. It is a safety net for the government that is used to provide for the poor. It's not the first option, it's the last, ladies and gentlemen. What they're coming up and saying, what they're coming up and saying is that it's the first option that we should provide from the get-go. Then we believe that it's not true. They came up and gave us the, the, the example of the US and of Britain. Ladies and gentlemen, this concept has, not, has already failed in Great Britain. Complete welfare has never has been tried and never succeeded in Great Britain or any of the communist countries. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, so they're proposing basically a fair system that we do not agree with. First, secondly, they are saying that um, it, what we would say is that it's going to actually kill free market. It is the right of the hardworking and the successful, like we said earlier, to get superior education or health care. It's not a right, but it's a luxury. It's not a right for any every member of the public, but it's a luxury and privilege. And they think that putting up welfare systems for housing, education will actually uh, lesser the competition. If we're going to make everything under the public sector, it's going to decrease the quality because of the lower funding. We believe that it's going to decrease the free market, and it's overall going to decrease the quality or the standards of the services being provided to the poor in the rich area, thereby decreasing their standards rather than increasing the standards of the poor people. Thirdly, they, they said that. They start, uh, we, uh, our extension, uh, sorry, third point is that we believe that it's actually going to decrease the strength of the poor people in the society. When you have a higher density of a certain cultural, ethnic, or social economic group in one area, uh, it actually decreases their strength. It increases their strength. When elections happen, they're going to be represented stronger by their own people who will understand their needs better. They remember when the voting happens, poor people will be voted in rather than good people who will be trying to cater for the needs of the poor. We believe they can have a representation in the government from the poor areas by the poor people is actually much better for the poor uh, and their needs to be heard by the government. Next, we believe that it's going to incentivize unemployment. There might be people who will be on the class of poor and not poor, but living in the poor area. But hey, look at this fancy new building in this fancy new area. Why not just leave your job, we'll give you a house here and try to find some better services there. There, we believe that just by providing these uh, no interest or free interest loans that these people are uh, talking about, we believe that it's actually going to increase unemployment rather than help the conditions of the poor in any case in the society. And lastly, we believe that it's going to promote discrimination. There's a fine line that's going to be drawn by between the rich and the poor area by what they're saying. But they're saying that, oh, we just move them from that dirty dirty area into this fancy looking one. Later, we believe that the money that they're proposing should be used to boost up those areas. Why not invest that money in the poor area, build up their education system, build up their house care, improve their houses, improve their roads, improve the quality of their lives, provide them subsidies if you want, and make their lives better. And that's why they think we're proud to propose. Thank you. I would like to thank the speaker for his speech and for one player to the line of the line to complete the case for the proposition. And secondly, how to create a more inclusive and equitable society. 
So under the first question, we hear from the opening opposition telling us that our model is shifting the burden solely on the rich people. And then from the closing opposition, that our model is opting for a welfare state, which is supposedly a last option, without any justification whatsoever. So let me engage them. We say that first of all, there's no pure, like, extreme, like there's no there's no extreme characterization of whether once we provide poor housing or public housing for the poor people, then it suddenly becomes a welfare state. We say that the spectrum is freely like between the two extremes where they can like enter into. And secondly, and more importantly, is no matter what kind of ideal government ideal ideology that this side is opting for, we say that all kind of forms of government also bear the same. Uh, common role of resource redistribution. We say that it is never the role of the government to be only the agent of the rich people that has characterized by opening opposition that because it received the money from the rich people and has only should benefit the rich people and should not play whatsoever any burden that benefits the rich poor and more the rich people. We say that it is a wrongful characterization of that. And we also we, all, we, also, uh, we also say that it's inconsistent on their line by saying that on one hand they say, if they say it's justifiable to use public resources to actually help the poor, but on the other, they say that it is actually infringing the rich people's right because they pay the tax. How do you do? So we told you, the rich people fulfill a duty and provide a minimum care for the poor people by providing public housing. So what we should do is that provide more money and more support by using the explicitly my partner has already amply told you this model is not about increasing the burden, the monetary burden of the rich, right? We're talking about like which places we should choose to build public housing. So we don't understand how it comes to increasing rich people's burden actually can stand. So what my second and more important clash of today's debate is how to create a more inclusive and equitable society. As I already told you, the government role is not only to serve the rich, it is to actually allow different people to like pour the to pour the resources, to give the resources, to like sacrifice part of their asset to the government. So the government can carry out a resource redistribution process to create a protective, inclusive and equitable society. No, even if you are opting for the most capitalistic society in the world, such as Hong Kong, we don't see it in the same <laughs> that Hong Kong government simply just like leave all the poor people and die and work capitalism. Not how a government works, right? Even in the most capitalistic society, government does protect people. And it's also unrealistic to assume that, okay, in welfare areas, there will be no poor people and that's like, Poor people doesn't need to live. It's unrealistic to assume that there must be some sort of measures to like serve the need of the poor people in terms of housing. And we don't see that as a clear answer from this side of the house. So let me deal with this clash more, more directly. So first thing is about the idea of whether practically our model can lead to an inclusive society. So they have been talking about like, okay. The rich, uh, the poor people, even if they are in wealthy areas, they will not be like engaged by uh, education service because like the schools are very uh, expensive. So we say that firstly, no part of our model preclude the improvement of public services in wealthy areas, right? We don't see it as an absolutely mutual exclusivity. By on one hand, allowing your economy to prosper and allowing your like economy to be well to be wealthy. But on the other hand, to strengthen your public service, just like Singapore, just like Hong Kong, right? They can balance both. And on a on, on second idea, what this side has been telling us is that our, our, what, what our opening has been telling you is that our model does actually create a more equitable society. Because first of all, when poor people are in your community, it becomes a necessity for the rich people to actually engage them and try to embrace their needs and take into the calculation of your policy formation. And then we hear the idea from the closing opposition that, okay, it is actually bad because like it strengthens the like uh, leverage of this group of people and like make your society less competitive. First of all, we don't understand why would a society become more sort of multi, like embrace more different kind of people. And suddenly, it would decrease your 
competitiveness. There's no in, no, no elaborate on that. But on the other, on the second level, we said it is actually better to embrace all kinds of people because in the past we say that they'll sit down because in the, we, we say that under the status quo, there's a divide in the political system that only the rich people get the dominance and without considering the voices and needs of the poor people, which actually defeat the very purpose of the government, which is to cater and lead and create an economic society that's not characterized for. And more important, and, and then we hear the arrow saying that, okay, wait, after we have implemented the model, the rich is still going to dominate, right? So we say that, so what we always see that we understand that the rich now have a dominance in the political system. But what we see is a more progressive need for today's model is to actually change the mindset of the rich people. That's right. <laughs> change the mindset of the people to actually let them, even if they are dominating the system, they still will be catered and lead. How we actually do that? We say that under the status quo, how the rich actually know about the situation of the poor is mostly because of hearsay, right? Like they can read from newspaper, but they don't actually see the devastating situations that they're actually facing, right? We say that the impact of allowing the poor people to actually be visualized by the rich people, to allowing the rich people to actually see the devastation that these people are facing, instead of only having hearsay reports from media or from whatever uh, channels that they get information. It, is, it actually drives, it's a net more progressive way to put this kind of, to drive a sympathy, to, uh, in, to actually allow the rich people to un truly understand the need of these people and actually take their needs into consideration. The, all, the final idea of this slide is about the stigma and discrimination of the poor people. We don't see that the stigma actually stands. We don't say we see that stigma is only uh, fully tackled by the fact that we allow these people to have the channels of understanding, allowing them to actually reside in the same community instead of segregating them and allow the stigma to continue forever. So for all that we should be proud of both. Thank you. I would like to thank you. Speech and hold on prior to complete the case for the opposition bench and private debate in Holland. Ladies and gentlemen, the government's model here was to abandon and move poor areas in favor of pushing poor people in the streets of rich areas and magically see them prosper with only the promise of free housing. We say here in the opposition that they are the ones creating a failing socioeconomic experiment to satisfy their ideals of helping the poor when we are in fact the ones interested in helping the poor in a way that they can actually prosper. Ladies and gentlemen, I've identified three clashes in this debate, um, starting with the fact that if, starting with the fact that creating public housing for ethnic integration in general will not work, the fact that the first speaker spoke about Singapore where, where ethnicities were, di were diverse basically and they managed to, to, they managed to be integrated, a small state with a limited amount, with, with a lot of resources managed to actually do this where you're actually proposing minorities pushed into a majority of rich people's areas, take their money to support them is a different scenario which the first speaker actually admitted would not the second class that I've identified is this, this idea that uh, these poor people, by moving into these public areas, would have access to these utilities that the rich cities actually provide. The point is, school integration, but is a different debate, what still disregards these poor areas, these poor areas that can be uh, improved, basically. Instead, you're saying that you're going to either subsidize rich areas in order to give, if you're going to subsidize rich areas in order to give, to give them uh, to give uh, uh, poor people access to these schools while um, while disturbing the actual functioning society of the rich area, their their private their private schools, their private expensive schools, and the, and what rich people pay for for these schools. Yes, sir. Yes. All those improvements are uh, catered to the poor at the expense of public expenses will not happen because of the rich dominance in the political sphere, political discussion, unless there's a substantial mindset change in the rich people, which is brought by today's policy. 
So you're saying that if the government can actually invest on public areas in rich, in, in rich neighborhoods, you're saying that they're going to spend on these public houses, spend on the rent and everything. They can't actually spend on improving economic areas. Saying that you're, you're doing it for the sake of the poor means you're doing, you can do other things for the sake of the poor in the same sense. You're also, no, wait. You're saying that these poor areas are actually, no, thank you. These poor areas are, these poor people are going to go into the, into the rich area and these people are basically going to embrace them. Like, oh, these poor people, they're taking our money, but it's okay because we want to help them and stuff. But you're actually taking their money, you're disturbing social atmosphere. You're not helping these areas that are just le literally left for destitution. No, thank you. You're leaving these areas that are left for destitution. And you're not, you're not, if, you're not actually helping them, those poor people prosper in any way. The, the point. The, th the third flash in this argument is the fact that going this debate is about the poor people. They're going to go into the rich state, the rich, rich city. They're going to have they're going to have a public space where they can live in. But basically, their large their large pay, as emphasized by the government, is still going to be eaten up by general spending on things government seems to disregard beyond rent. Suddenly. Food, transportation, utilities, and groceries don't matter. Suddenly they're going to off. No, thank you. Suddenly they're going to have access to good jobs when basically corporations and jobs, corporations that actually are owned by their are going to be open and going to hire them on basis of lower opportunities that they have. They're going to be forever stuck on basically vendor stands on areas where in, in rich areas where they can't even afford. Because the corporations won't even hire them for their local qualifications. And instead, what you can actually do is, if you really want to improve the life of the poor, you can actually improve their own areas. You can provide them an equal chance to actually compete in a rich area city. An equal education, an equal opportunity for them to come up and not be discriminated against by those rich, or by those rich people who have, whose money has been taken in order to facilitate the social experiment of yours. You can't push poor people into a street and hope that their life is suddenly going to get better because they're still subject to the same the same fears and the same issues that the rich people can actually use the afford because they can. But they're not going to make it any easier for the poor people who are there. You suddenly magically expect subsidies. You suddenly magically expect school integration into these private schools. No, thank you, sir. You suddenly expect these things to happen by rich people who you admitted control this in those areas. So why, why, sir, would they actually help these, would they actually help those areas, would, would they actually help these poor people prosper? They would basically look at that big building with poor people and say, hey, let's just wait for them to sit there. Let's just wait for them to sit there. And uh, basically, what, when they realize that they can't actually afford this area, they're going to go away. So there you go. Your social experiment failed on basis of not on favor in favor of actually just making giving more money to to the poor areas and helping them them prosper and enter this rich sphere of that you seem to easily integrate. No, thank you, sir. So you get poor people into a rich area, they'll be faced with discrimination. They'll be faced with unequal opportunities. They'll be faced with school that schools that are expensive, groceries that are expensive, everything that is expensive. And they'll be faced they'll be faced with no say or vote in, in this area because of course they will be they will be no thank you sir. They will be they will be they will be uh, the majority of the area will be rich while the minority of the area will be will, will be poor. So you're just assuming that this 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 community is going to embrace a people who don't have the equal equal opportunities in the state. So ladies and gentlemen, what have we brought you here? We're saying that instead of actually integrating poor people into rich areas, you should give these poor that you should take those funds and give those poor poor people a chance to actually prosper by giving them the actual the actual uh, utilities, uh, the schooling, the, the education that they deserve in their areas in order for them to go out into the world with equal opportunities without the discrimination they would face otherwise. Thank you, sir. I would like to